Okay, let's start with the Eumenides, the third and final play of the Oresteia. Notice the, the setting at the beginning of the play, um, or, or at least what we're told for the setting at the beginning of the play, that the play is going to shift locations from um, where, what we see at the beginning of the play, the first 234 lines, to the end of the play, uh, we're going to move from Delphi, where the oracle of Apollo speaks, or where the oracle is received and spoken through the Pythia, the, the spokesperson, as it were. And the final lines of the play, meaning everything after line 234, um, is set in Athens at the Areopagus. Okay? So we're told um, when the play opens, Pythia speaks. Uh, this is page 123 in our edition. I give first place of honor in my prayer to her who of the gods was prophesied the earth, and next to Thamus, who succeeded to her mother's place of prophecy, so runs the legend. And in third succession given by free consent, not one by force, another titan daughter of earth was seated here. This was Phoebe. She gave it as a birthday gift to Phoebus. What the Pythia is speaking about there is or are the various deities or powers that spoke through the oracle at Delphi, okay? The first one was Earth. The second one was Thamus, which is a word that means kind of um, tradition or uh, custom, if you want, okay? One after Thamus is uh, Phoebe, and I'm looking at another note. She's one of the Titan goddesses associated with the moon. You'll, you'll see that name show up in a lot of uh, classical literature or in a lot of literature set in a classical period, like some of Shakespeare's plays and such. Okay, And then the last one, Phoebus, who is Apollo, who is the grandson of um, Phoebe. Okay, So what the, the Pythia is doing there is kind of... Um, giving her bona fides, her, her, um, her credentials for being the spokesperson of the, at this time, ruling god of the oracle, right? So continue speaking, I'm skipping over to page 124. And mentions, Hephaestus' sons conveyed him here, for these are builders of roads and changed the wilderness to a land that was no wilderness. Now, interestingly, what, what those two lines are talking about, and let me back up and read where that passage begins. Deep in respect for his degree, Hephaestus' sons conveyed him here, for these are builders of roads and changed the wilderness to a land that was no wilderness, right? That, the he that's being referred to there is essentially Apollo, right? So what is that referring to? Referring to? these builders of roads and changed the wilderness to a land that was no wilderness. It's the process of civilization. That is, Hephaestus' sons, remember Hephaestus is the smith god, the maker god, the, the creator, the originator, not, not like, you know, ex nihilo, the Judeo-Christian god. I mean, he's, he's the god of the, of the forge, as it were, right? So what she's talking about is the transformation of wilderness to civilization, the transformation of unpaved rocky ground to flat paved roads that enables people to move from point A to point B in a relatively quick manner. Interestingly, we're not even 15 lines into this play and we get one of the major themes. And it's, it's a theme that's related to the theme of what is justice that we saw in the previous two plays, because the transformation or the progress, if you want, that we see through these plays is this move from a wild, inchoate, chaotic retribution and vengeance to a rational, logical, thought out, Conscient, conscientious, moral, legal 
idea of justice, okay? And in fact, it's, it's not only all those things, it's the very model of justice from which we today still operate, trial by jury. Prior to that, it was, you kill somebody I love, I'm gonna kill somebody you love. There's, there's no jury, there's no, is this right or wrong? It's simply eye for eye, right? Um, so she continues going on, talks about, you know, Apollo and such, and says, line 19, so, which means really thus, Loxius, the other name for Apollo, is the spokesman of his father Zeus. That is, when Apollo speaks, the implication is, he's speaking on behalf of Zeus. So, go back to the libation bearers, and what did we hear Orestes say repeatedly, especially at the end, though? He did what he did because Apollo told him to. So take that in connection with this line. And what the Pythia is telling us is Orestes did what he did because Zeus told him to. Keep in mind, Zeus is the sky father. He's, he's the ruler of the gods, all right? So these are the gods I set in the proem of my prayer, prayer. That is the prologue, the beginning of my prayer. But palace before the temple, Pallas is the goddess Athena. She's the goddess of wisdom, right? She sided with the Greeks against the Trojans. But Pallas before the temple has her right in all, I say. That is, Pallas Athena, which is an, another way of referring to her, the speaker is saying, kind of has a say in everything. Why? She's the offspring of Zeus. She was formed directly from Zeus's mind. Right? We're going to be told about her later. She has no father. Right? What else? Well, she's the goddess of wisdom. Implying wisdom should have a say in everything. Everything should be done according to wisdom. All right? And then she goes on and talks about, you know, um, Dionysius and the Bacchanalian rebels and that kind of stuff. Gets down to the um, where there's a little break in the page on page 124. Um, line 30, one, two, three. My prophecy is only as the God may guide. That is, the Pythia, Pythia is saying, I don't speak at all for myself. I don't speak on my own behalf. I don't offer my own opinions. I say only what the God tells me to say. Okay. And then she says, she comes out crawling on all fours, things terrible to tell and for the eyes to see. Terrible drove me out again from Loxia's house. That is, she goes into the temple and then comes back out again, crawling, almost like looking backwards in terror because of what she's seen. That is, because of the prophecies that she has seen and received. Skipping a bit, line 40. I see a man with God's defilement on him postured in the suppliant seat. That is, at the place of supplication to Apollo with blood dripping from his hands and from a new drawn sword, holding to a branch that had grown high on an olive tree decorously wrapped in a great tuft of wool and the fleece shown, okay? So what does she see? She sees um, Orestes with all the hallmarks of someone seeking grace and favor from the God, of someone seeking supplication from the God, right? So Orestes gets there, and I'm reading from a footnote from a different edition. Orestes, because he's taken his mother's life, Orestes must be ritually purged of the pollution of blood before he can be tried at law. So here, where we see him, he's holding the olive branch wrapped with fleece. You know, these are the emblems customary for those seeking, according to this footnote, purgation. All right? So she goes on. In front of this man slept a startling company of women lying all upon the chairs. Not women, but Gorgons. So when she went in the temple, the vision that she saw is 
Orestes sitting in the supplicant seat and kind of surrounding him are the Furies, but they're sound asleep. And she gives a description of them, line 52. They are black and utterly repulsive. They snore with breath that drives them back. From their eyes drips the foul ooze, that is blood. Their dress is such as it's not right to wear in the presence of the god statues, nor even in any human house. So these are just, you know, abhorrent to behold, right? She leaves, the temple doors open, and Apollo comes out. And Apollo says, looking at Orestes, again, surrounded by the sleeping furies, I will not give you up. Now, that's Apollo making a short, simple, declarative statement, you know, less than 70 lines into the poem. Another way of putting that is, you are mine. I will protect you. Through to the end, standing your guardian, whether by your side or far away, I shall not weaken toward your enemies. See now how, how I have caught and overpowered these rabid creatures. In other words, I put them to sleep. They can't harm you. All right? Line 71. It was because of evil they were born, because they hold the evil darkness of the pit below earth, loathed alike by men and by the heavenly gods. The heavenly gods, the Olympian gods, he's kind of suggesting, have put the Furies down in the pit because they, they don't want them up with them because they're so repulsive. Nevertheless, top of 126, line 74, run from them, never weaken. Don't stop. They will chase your track as you stride on along across the earth, uh, across the long land, and your feet, your driven feet forever pound the earth. Skip a line, never fail until you come at last to Pallas's citadel. So he's telling Orestes what to do. When, when you leave here, he's essentially saying, I'll keep them asleep for a while, but, but they will waken, they will chase you. You've got to run and never stop. Don't tire until you get to Pallas Athena's citadel. Line 80, kneel there and clasp the ancient idol in your arms. That's what's called the palladium, right? It was a wooden symbol of Athena. So he's saying, when you get there, go up and, you know, clutch it. You know, put your, wrap your body around this thing. And there we shall find those who will judge this case in words to say that will have magic in their figures. He's, he's telling Orestes, there, once you get to Pallas Athena's citadel, someone will come to judge your case. It won't be simple vengeance. It won't be simple retributive justice, right? This, thus, will you, thus you will be rid of your afflictions once for all. Well, what are his afflictions? Partly, the guilt of killing his mother, but it's also the curse born in the race. It's the afflictions of being a son, grandson, of Atreus. He says, there, at Pallas Athena's place, you will be cured of your familial sin. Or let's use, you know, let's kind of bring in the Judeo-Christian tradition. You will be cured of your original sin, of your fallen human nature. I don't mean that literally. I don't mean he's, so in, he's suddenly you know, going to become totally sinless or anything like that. And then Apollo, again, another short, simple declarative statement. For it was I who made you strike your mother down. That's Apollo saying, I bear the responsibility. You are not guilty. I bear the responsibility, all right? So Orestes says, none can mistrust your power to do good if you will. That is, if you so desire. If you so desire to do good, none can deny your power. Apollo, remember, let not the fear overcome your heart. He doesn't tell Orestes not to fear. He says, don't let the fear overcome your heart. Don't let the fear overwhelm you. 
Why do people commit suicide? They let the darkness overwhelm them. They look down a tunnel and they see no light. They feel like they've fallen into a hole and there's no escape. That is, the fear, the darkness overwhelms that individual. <coughs> and notice it's the heart. Why the heart? Because the heart isn't only the seat of emotion. The heart is the seat of courage. So let not your fear overwhelm your courage. He's telling Orestes, you can do this. You can do this. Fight on. Okay? And then he gives Hermes, his brother God, you know, a charge. And he says, help him. He is my suppliant. Line 91, shepherd him with fortunate escort on his journeys among men. Look at this next sentence. The wanderer has rights which Zeus acknowledges. That's that Xenia idea I was talking about. The, the, the traveler, the wayfarer, has rights that Zeus, he is saying, is obligated to uphold. Right? So Apollo goes into the temple. Orestes, kind of guided by Hermes, goes off to the side. And the ghost of Clytemnestra comes up. What does she do? She speaks to the sleeping furies. You would sleep then? And what use are you if you sleep? It is because of you I go dishonored thus among the rest of the dead. She's saying, down here in Hades, everybody's laughing at me because you're not out there fighting for me. Line 10, uh, yeah, 101 on page 127. None among the powers is angered for my sake that I was slaughtered. The powers, she's talking about the gods. They don't care about what happened to me. And in, in doing that, she is setting up the furies to oppose the gods. And, and we're going to hear the furies. And the, the furies have issues with the Olympian gods. Because they've, in one sense, they've replaced the furies. Sure, she cries out, skipping several lines down to one. 13, hear me, 115, for I, the dream of Clytemestra, call upon your name, and the furies start to stir. They don't get up suddenly, right? Clytemestra has to keep talking to finally rouse them, and she does, and they move, they move, they moan, et cetera, et cetera, and then finally, line 130, the furies are aroused. They awake, they awaken, they stand up. And we hear them all together. Get them, get them, get them, get them. Make sure. That is, kill them. Clytemnestra speaks. She says, chase them. The chorus leader, waken, you are awake. Line 140, wake her as I did you. And so they, you know, everybody gets, gets awakened. And then into strophe A. These are the Furies speaking now. Shame son of zeus that's apollo robber is all you are that is you've stolen our rightful prey from us yourself top of 129 yourself a god you stole the matricide away the matricide orestes where in this act shall any man say there is right how can any man on earth say what you've done is correct okay Strophe B, they keep talking. And um, pick up with anti-strophe B. Page 129, line 162, I think it is. Such are the actions of the younger gods, that is, the Olympians. These, the younger gods, the Olympians, Zeus, Hera, Apollo, Hermes, Hephaestus, these occupy by unconditional force. She's saying, you are the ruling gods now because you usurped the place of the previous gods, which is true, they did. Right? Well, what did Apollo just do with Orestes? They are saying he usurped our place, place of vengeance, by taking Orestes and sending him off. 
So he's kind of, you know, acting according to his nature. His, his nature as one of the Olympians is to replace the Titans, etc. So these occupy by unconditional force beyond all right, a throne that runs reeking blood, blood at the feet, blood at the head, the very stone center of earth here in our eyes, horrible with blood and curse stands plain to see. They're just laying it out. The Olympian gods, they have no moral authority. They have power. That's what makes what they do right. According, according to the Furies, because they have power, they're the ones in control. They're not saying that they have a moral right to rule. And there's, in, in Greek mythology, there is no, you know, in, in Greek, the gods mythology, there, there's nothing necessarily moral. There's, there's no appeal to a moral standard, like Zeus's righteousness or Zeus's holiness, like you, didn't, like you get in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's, you know, Zeus is the chief of the gods because he's the strongest, period. If Poseidon and all the others wanted to overthrow Zeus, yeah, they probably could. If, I mean, it would take a lot. But. So they continue talking, and we see line 171. He made man's way across the place of the ways of God and blighted age-old distributions of power. That is, they're saying Apollo broke the old traditions. He crossed the old ways. That is the age old distributions of power. It used to be our right to chase down, you know, um, killers of parents. She's saying Apollo's changed that. Line 175, 174. He has wounded me, that is Apollo, has wounded me, but he shall not get this man away. Let him hide under the ground, that's Orestes. He shall never go free. Now, I don't think that means let him crawl into a cave. I think it means let him die. Even if he dies a natural age, excuse me, a natural death at an old age, we're going to hound him in death. Cursed suppliant, he shall feel against his head another murder rising out of the same seed. In other words, the curse of Thyestes on Atreus's house will be visited on Orestes's children. They, they've just told us, if Orestes goes free, his children will pay for it. it it's kind of like the Old Testament, you know, idea of the sins of the fathers are visited upon the fourth generation. So Apollo comes in. That is, he comes out from his temple and he sees the Furies and he tells them, go away, leave. Why? This is his, this is his, his domain. Leave from here. From your presence, set the mantic chamber free, else you may feel the flash and bite of a flying snake, etc. You better leave or you're going to feel my wrath. Okay? 185 on the top of page 130. This house is no right place for such as you to cling upon, but where by judgment given, heads are lopped and eyes gouged out, throats cut, and by destruction of seed, the potency of boys is ruined. That's kind of like the offspring, the power of boys. Where mutilation lives and stoning and the long moan of tortured men spiked underneath the spine and fixed on stakes. That is, that's the place where you should be where heads are lopped off, eyes are gouged, throats are cut. They should be where the dead are. They should be where there's carnage, where there's destruction, where there's hatred. 192, the whole way you look is guide to what you are. And that's part and parcel of, of Greek ideology. What you see on the outside is what you see on the inside. If someone is foul, ugly on the outside, the Greeks took that to mean they were also foul and ugly on the inside. The likes of whom should hole in the cave, that is, you, Furies, 
You should hide in the cave of the blood reeking lion, not wipe off your filth on others nearby in this oracular sanctuary. Out then, you flock of goats without a herd, Vincent, no God has such affection as to tend this herd. Okay. So they speak to him and they say, the guilt is yours. You're the one who did it all. He said, so how, you know, why are you still here? You gave this outlander the word to kill his mother. And Apollo corrects the word to exact price for his father. Notice, it is the same as killing his mother, but Apollo's looking at it from, you know, he's taking the coin and kind of flipping it over. You then dared take him in fresh from this bloodletting? Apollo, line 205. Yes. And I told him to take refuge in this house. So he says, yes, I took him in. And what else? I told him to take refuge. That is, Apollo is following the law of Thinia. Orestes came to his house, temple, knocked on the door, and Apollo brought him in and did what? Protected him. See that, that idea I mentioned in the previous lecture? That even if your enemy comes to your house and knocks on your door, you, according to the law of hospitality, you are bound to give that enemy, you know, food and lodging and such. Well, part of that also is if your enemy's enemy then comes attacking, your enemy, while your enemy is under your roof, by that very law of hospitality, you are obligated to defend your enemy, right? So Apollo says, yes, I told him to come here and to take refuge, that is, and he is now under my protection. Yet you abuse us, the Furies? How? How do they say he abuses them? By denying them their rights. What are their rights? The rest is death. See, it's, it's, it's their right, almost. I mean, without this being spelled out in like a, a codified law, it's their right to drink Orestes' blood, almost. And Apollo says, yes, yes, it was, you shouldn't be here. And yet we have our duty. That is, we have the thing to do for which we were made. It's why we exist. It, you know, what's the purpose of fire? To be hot, <laughs> to burn. It's like denying fire its ability to burn. Like, you know, a quality of water, it's wetness. It's, it's like saying, are you telling water it can't be wet? We have our duty to do what we have done. That is, not only to chase Orestes here, but to exact vengeance on all those we've exacted vengeance before. Apollo, in office, you, and by office, he's translating duty. Like, really, what is it? And the chorus makes it clear, to drive matricides out of their houses. Now, houses there might mean literally their physical homes. It could also mean the house of the body to kill them, to separate the soul from the flesh. Apollo, okay. So he throws out a, a hypothetical to them. What if it be the woman and she kills her husband? So let's, let's not talk about Orestes. Let, let's say a woman kills her husband. What is your duty then? What is your office then? What is your responsibility then? Not our problem. Why? Such murder would not be the shedding of kindred blood. See, this is another idea, the shedding of kindred blood, that, um, that that's a violation of a moral order. That's another Indo-European idea. And when I say it's Indo-European, I mean, it goes back to at least probably four to 5,000 BC to the small group of peoples who originally came out of 
either the southern steppes of, of what is now modern day Russia between the Caspian and Black Seas or eastern what is modern day Turkey or also called Anatolia. And, and it originally was a small group of people that gradually grew and grew and the small group of people, you know, kind of expanded and then started to break off in groups and go off to different areas. One group went off and settled in the Indian subcontinent and became the Indians, okay? Um, and they spoke the languages, you know, Punjabi and Bengali, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, one group went off and became the Slavic peoples of, let's say, Russia. One group went off, broke off, and became the Germanic-speaking peoples. One group broke off and became the Italic-speaking peoples, the Roman languages and such. One group broke off and became the Greek-speaking peoples. Another one became the Celts, all right? So the group that becomes the parent group of what are called today the Indo-European languages, all right? And apparently, when, when that group was still relatively small, they had some ideas that everybody held. Law of hospitality is one, right? Another idea was you don't kill your kinsmen, period. You don't kill your kinsmen. And how do we know that this was an idea shared by them? Because all the cultures that derive from the Indo-European peoples have this kind of basic understanding. It, it shows up in all of their mythologies that when you kill a kinsman, bad things are going to happen to you. So you have a, a duty not to kill your kinsman. So they say here, well, if a wife kills her husband, that's not an issue for us because that's not the shedding of kindred blood. Why? Because wives and husbands aren't kindred. They're not brother and sister. Now they might be, you know, cousin, distant cousin, but that's not, we, that's not what's being discussed here. Apollo, you have made into a thing of no account, no place that is of having no value, the sworn faith of Zeus and of Hera. That is, you have made marriage into nothing. You have said marriage accounts for absolutely nothing. But notice how they qualify, excuse me, how Apollo qualifies here, a lady of consummations, consummations, the consummation, sexual intercourse of the marriage. And Cypris, by such argument, is thrown away. And I have a note, Cypris. Um, that's fate. Outlawed, and yet the sweetest things in man's life come from her. For married love between man and woman is bigger than oaths, guarded by right of nature. In this other edition I'm looking at, Fagels translates those lines as, why you disgrace, obliterate the bonds of Zeus and here a queen of brides. And the queen of love, you throw to the winds at a word. Disgrace, love. The source of mankind's nearest, dearest ties. Marriage of man and wife is fate itself, stronger than oaths. And justice guards its life. Right? What Green and Lattimore guarded by right of nature. That's what they translate, you know, what Fagel calls justice. So they're saying, excuse me, Apollo is saying, you would destroy the thing that brings the most meaning to human existence. That's married love between man and woman is bigger than oaths. If when such kill each other, you are slack so as not to take vengeance, nor I them in wrath, then I deny your manhunt of Orestes goes with right. That is, it's not proper. It's not moral. He's appealing there to kind of a universal idea, a universal truth, a 
a universal standard of, of behavior, that there are certain things that are never right. I see that one cause moves you to strong rage, but on the other, clearly you are unmoved to act. You know who's gonna solve this? Palace divine shall review the pleadings of this case. The language that's used there, notice what it is. It's a law court. Palace divine, wisdom divine, because she's the goddess of wisdom. Divine wisdom, that's what we'll review, the pleading. So he's suggesting you will get to plead your argument, and Aristides will get to plead his argument, and wisdom will determine which is the correct, who has the correct answer. 225. Nothing will ever make me let that man go free. That's the chorus leader. Speaking for the Furies, saying, I don't care what Pallas Athena determines. We will never let him go. Ever. Apollo says, go ahead, keep chasing him. Okay. So, turn to the next page. They leave. Okay. And Apollo says, I'm going to give him help. And we get stage directions. This is after line 234. Now we were told at the beginning, lines one through 234 all happen at the Oracle at Delphi. 235 and following all happen in Athens. So all exit separately. The scene is now Athens on the Acropolis in front of the temple and statue of Athena. Orestes enters from the side and he takes up a suppliant posture. It's kind of like on his knees, you know, hands up raised, maybe wrapped around the, the statue, around the feet of the statue. And he prays to Athena. My lady Athena, this is page 132, line 235. My lady Athena, it is at Loxius's behest I come. So take in of your grace the wanderer who comes, Ixinia, hospitality, no suppliant, not unwashed of hand, but one blunted at last, that means beaten down, and worn and battered on the outland habitations and the journeyings of men. He didn't come, arrive at Athens, get all washed and cleaned up, put on a nice suit and show up. He means, I've just arrived through the mud, the muck, the dry sand, whatever. He's covered in filth crossing the dry land and the sea alike, keeping the ordinances of Apollo's oracle, that is, I've obeyed the God. I come, goddess, before your statue and your house to keep watch here and wait the issue of my trial. Now, bear in mind what trial means. We, we think that word trial, oh, law court, judge, jury, prosecutor, defense attorney, whole nine yards. Well, what else does it mean? It's a test. People make trials of their strength. When I used to run marathons, you know, part of the, the quote unquote, you know, masochistic fun of running a marathon would be to see, can I improve my time? You know, weightlifting, which I do now, you know, can I increase the amount of weights I lift? It's a, it's a trial of strength or perseverance or character. So he's going to await the issue of his trial, both legal proceeding and everything he's been going through since the death of Clytemestra. All of that is part of his trial, his testing, which is one of the reasons why Apollo told him to let fear not overcome his heart. That's trying his courage, okay? So the chorus leader comes in and they're looking for him. They don't see him. Top of 133. They say, our man has gone to cover somewhere in this place. Gone to cover, it means he's gone into hiding. The welcome smell of human blood. It's kind of like the, you know, the giant in the nursery rang, fee fi fo fum. I smell the blood of an English. 
they smell the blood of Clytemnestra's hands, as it were, on Orestes. Okay? And then they see him. And we get to lines 258. He clings to the fence again, his arms winding the immortal goddess's image, so seeks a quiddle out of her hands. His mother's blood spilled on the ground, cannot come back again. 264, you must give back for her blood from the living man, red blood of your body to suck. And from your own, I could feed with bitter swallowed drench. Skipping several lines, 273, Hades is great. Hades calls men to reckoning there under the ground. Sees all, inscribes it deep in his recording mind. Keep in mind, Hades there is referring to the god, Hades, who's the god of the underworld that is also named after him, okay? Orestes then speaks, uh, 276. I have been beaten and been taught. I understand the many rules of absolution, where it is right to speak and where be silent. In this action now, speech has been ordered by my teacher who is wise, that's Apollo. The stain of blood dulls now and fades upon my hand. My block of matricide is being washed away because he's done the proper rituals of purgation. When it was fresh still at the heart of the god, Phoebus, it was absolved and driven out by sacrifice of a pig. He tells us, you know, I obeyed the laws. 286, time in his aging overtakes all things alike. What phrase do we have today that we still use that means that same thing? Time heals all wounds. That's one way of understanding it. Another, time conquers all. It's one of the favorite themes in William Shakespeare's 154 series of sonnets. The theme of time, how time wears everything down. Time makes us all equal. Whether we are poor, pauper, rich, president, you know. So he says, now from pure mouth with good auspices, that is, hope for the future, I call upon Athena, queen of this land, to come and rescue me. She, without work of her spear, shall win myself and all my land and all the Argive host, that is, she'll win me, she'll protect me, she'll win my land, my kingdom, and all the Argive host, my people, to stand her staunch companion for the rest of time. That's, that's Orestes telling us, I'm gonna walk out of here alive and I'm going to swear allegiance to Athena. Bear in mind, Athens is not part of his kingdom. Athens is, a, is a, uh, essentially um, not an enemy kingdom, but it's a competitor, okay? But he says, she without work of her spear. Athena's going to do this without violence. That's a pretty big change. That's part of that aspect I was talking about earlier of, you know, the civilizing action from the first play through the third play. The first play, you know, justice is vengeance. That's it. Here, he's saying justice isn't vengeance. She won't have to use her spear. And, and, and by that, he means she's not going to come in with her spear and kill all the Furies. No, this is going to be resolved through reason, through logic through maybe even a little compassion, you know, mercy, okay? Um, so he finishes little, his little speech, 298. So may she set me free from what is at my back. Well, there's two things he has at his back. What always follows us? What do we, in a sense, always have chasing us? It's time. Time is pursuing us. What do most people want? They don't want time to catch up. Um, Emily Dickinson has a beautiful little poem. Because I could not stop for death. The speaker is too busy. The speaker's got 
life going on. And the speaker says, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Because I was too busy, death showed up, okay? So he's saying, she'll set me free from that. He's not saying I will live eternally. He's saying, I'm not going to die now. What's the other thing? The furies, pursuing him, right? But the chorus leader of the Fury says, neither Apollo nor, neither Apollo nor Athena's strength can win you free, save you from going down forgotten. They can't stop you from dying. Right? The chorus then chants, very bottom of page 134. We hold, we are straight and just. Straight means upright, you know, like this, perfectly upright, okay, and just. We hold what we are doing, they are asserting, is morally right. If a man can spread his hands and show they are clean, no wrath of ours shall look for him. That is, if he can show he doesn't have disdain of sin, here the implication is, shedding of kindred blood, we won't bother him. Unscathed, he walks through his lifetime. But, but one like this man, the stained, hidden hands, and the guilt upon him? No, he'll find us beside him as witnesses of the truth, and we shall clear in the end to avenge the blood of the murder. That's, that's, that's their notion of justice, vengeance. Blood for blood, life for life. Right? So they go back and forth and they talk about destiny, which means the fates really, bottom of 135. This the purpose, this is line 334, this the purpose that all involving destiny spun to be ours and to be shaken never. In the Greek mythological system, as I mentioned, you know, you've got the gods over here and the fates over here or fate over here? Well, the fate is actually three. There are three fates. Atropo, A-T-R-O-P-O-S, Clotho, C-L-O-T-H-O, and Lachesis, L-A-C-H-E-S-I-S. -S. And what the three fates did was they spun, measured, and cut the thread of life. This idea that we all, we all hang by a thread, right? Atropo, excuse me, Clotho was the one who spun the thread of our life. So, so to speak, brought us into existence. Lachesis was the one who then took that thread, you know, from here to down here, measured it out. So Clotho spins the yarn, Lachesis measures the yarn, the yarn, and Atropo comes up like with scissors and snip and cuts the thread. In the Germanic system, the fates are the norns, right? So they said, you know, they talk about we're related to the fates. We do what the, the fates ordain and such. Next page, 136, line 349. When we were born, such lots, fates, were assigned for our keeping. So the immortals must hold hands off. That is, this, the gods have no right in this. The gods have no say in this. Nor is there one of them who shall sit at our feasting in pure white robes. I have no interest and in, no portion. I don't want to be like one of them in their nice white robe sitting up on Olympus. Right? Um, we get strophes and refrains going on back and forth. Pick up with line 360. Being eager to save all others from these concerns by our efforts, we provide for the gods immunity. And no appeal comes to them since Zeus has ruled our blood dripping company outcast. Nor will deal with us. What? What they're saying is, or they're questioning, 
whether the new gods, the Olympian gods, Zeus, et cetera, et cetera, whether they really have any say in what they're calling justice. They're saying, this is out of their purview. This is not part of their responsibility. And what we've been told several times is that Zeus kind of does think humanity falls within his wheelhouse. Humanity falls within his circle of influence, right? Um, skip over to the next page at the bottom, line 389. Is there a man who does not fear this, does not shrink to hear how my place has been ordained, ordained, set into, you know, stone, like by the fates? They're, they're saying, we cannot help to do but what we do, because it's what we were made to do. Granted and given by destiny, the fates, and the gods, absolute, that is the older gods, the, the pre-Olympian gods, Privilege primeval is mine. Privilege, it means right of law. Primeval, beginning of time. They're saying by right of law from the beginning of time, we have the right and authority, nor am I without place, though it be underneath the ground and in no sunlight and in no darkness, that I must stand. Now let me read a footnote from this other edition, clarifying those lines. Uh, hold on just one second. Um, let me back up for a minute to where that passage begins. So the passage that began, line 389 or so, is there a man who does not fear this, does not shrink to hear, all my place has been ordained, etc. So in Fagel's translation, that reads, so the center holds, we are the skilled, the masterful, we the great fulfillers, memories of grief, we awesome spirits, stern, unappeasable demand, disgrace, degraded, drive our powers through, banished far from God to a sunless, torchlit dusk, we drive men through the rugged passage, blind to dead, and those who see by day. Then where is the man not stirred with awe, not gripped by fear, to hear us tell the law that fate ordains, the gods concede the furies, absolute till the end of time. And so it holds, our ancient power still holds. We are not without our pride, though beneath the earth our strict battalions form their lines, groping through the mist and, and sun-starved night. So the lines that read, disgrace degraded, drive our powers through, Banished far from God to a sunless torchlit dusk. This footnote reads, these two lines applicable to either the Furies or their victims are a good gloss on the Furies. Both they and the punished sinners dwell in a dark underground world that is the polar opposite of the heaven and light where the newer gods dwell on Mount Olympus. Since the Furies and the sinners inhabit the same dark place, the Furies can be understood not just, and I alluded to this previously, not just as an external force of punishment, but also the guilty conscience, which occurs where? It, it, it's in the dark inner recesses, you know, of the soul or of the mind. The sinner is ultimately his or her own avenger. You'll read stories in the news. I saw one just the other day of someone who commits suicide. And the person does, it'll be said, the person did because he or she couldn't handle something they had done. Or sometimes something that had happened to them, which while not an action on his or her own part, they still feel guilty of or about. The, the thing I read the other day was a um, woman weather presenter, weather uh, forecaster, 
in a, uh, I think a Dallas TV, at a Dallas TV station. She was, you know, relatively young, in her 20s, I believe. She posted a note on Facebook talking about her, uh, something like her previous sins, uh, uh, you know, confessing to some previous sin. Well, the previous sin wasn't something she sought out and initiated and performed. The previous sin, and, and she was found dead. It's presumed suicide. The, the previous sin was she was sexually groomed by a high school teacher. This is like, I don't know, it's at least five. I think it's about seven to 10 years after she graduated high school. She was consumed by the guilt that she felt of what happened to her not what she had sought out and initiated and done on her own, okay? That's what's being talked about. The, the, the furies within are worse than the furies without. The concept is akin to what Dante, as we'll see, intimates in his Inferno, that the outer and internal forces that punish sin are not clearly separable. The things that inside are really worse, worse punishers than the things that are outside. Again, what was Apollo's advice to Orestes? Or maybe command. Don't let fear overwhelm your heart. Because if he had, Orestes probably would have killed himself, right? People say this kind of stuff, you know, is irrelevant. It, it has nothing, nothing to say to us today. Um, it's nonsense, right? So Athena enters in full armor. So she looks like she's going to come in and do battle. She says, I heard your call, et cetera, et cetera. Line 404, uh, page 138. And now I see upon this land a strange new company, which though it brings no terror to my eyes, still brings wonder. Now, notice Athena's first comment. It's, it's not, she's not specifically addressing the chorus. But she does say, I see no problem with you. That is, their appearance does not repel her. She's not offended by it. Why? It's kind of like Athena is going, no, in my eyes, you're all beautiful children. You have your job. The rest is as his. We all have our own responsibilities, so to speak. She says it brings wonder. Why? Because the Furies aren't usually seen here. The Furies are usually down below. Who are you? I address you all alike. That is the Furies and Orestes. Both you, the stranger kneeling at my image here, and you, who are like no seed ever begotten. You aren't like any other born thing, not recognized by the gods as goddesses. That is, we don't recognize you as goddesses, but you're also not human. So it, it's like you are sui generis. You are of your own kind. But no, this is the place of the just. Its rights, that is, the rights of the just, and the rights of this place forbid to speak evil of another who is without blame. So she doesn't speak evil of the Furies. Why? They are without blame. They haven't violated any, you know, uh, moral laws or anything like that. 
And the chorus leader says, daughter of Zeus, you shall hear all compressed to brief measure. That is, we'll get to the point. We are the eternal children of the night. We are the, the offspring of darkness. Curses, they call us in our homes beneath the ground. She says, oh, okay, I know who you are then. And I know the names that they call you. And you'll soon know our prerogatives, that is, of our rights, what our duties and such. She says, I, yeah, I'll know them if you give me your clear account. 421, we drive from home those who have shed the blood of men. Okay, so we drive from home those who have shed the blood of men. Where is the place then where the killer's flight shall end? And that's the problem. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of all three plays. Where does that driving from home end? When does it stop? Does it stop with the death of one? Does it stop with the death of two? Does it stop with the death of 20? Does it stop with the death of a thousand? Does it stop with the death of all? Where shall the killers flight end. What is true justice? Chorus leader, here, I'll tell you where, a place where happiness is never more allowed. Well, in one sense, that's Hades. I mean, it's, it's death. Okay. Athena looks at Orestes. Is he one? Is he one who will never have happiness? Do you blast him to this kind of flight? Yes, he murdered his mother by deliberate choice. Notice, by deliberate choice, he chose to do this. And Athena asks a question, not by compulsion, nor fear of someone's wrath. He wasn't forced to do it, compelled. You know, if you're compelled to do something, you're not, you, maybe you are legally in some places, but you're not morally responsible for it. All right? If someone coerces you to do something, in most jurisdictions, especially in the United States, you are not legally held liable for that. You're not legally held responsible for that. Notice, nor fear of someone's wrath. Well, who's wrath? Apollo's? Apollo said, you know, you'll bring down the wrath of the gods. Where's the spur to justify man's matricide? That is, where is the urging? Where is the thing that would justify that? Athena says, well, here's two sides and only half the argument. That is, I've heard you speak. I haven't heard him speak yet. Chorus leader, he's unwilling to give or to accept an oath. Athena, so you want to be called righteous rather than act right? You want to be deemed righteous rather than to behave righteously? Chorus leader, no. How so? Explain. That is, what do you mean? I don't, I don't get your point. Athena says, I say wrong must not win merely by oaths. Okay, then you decide. Examine, examine him, then yourself. Decide it and be fair. Okay, so what is the furies, what are the furies the chorus doing then? Well, Athena takes what the furies just said, the chorus leader, and interprets it for us. So you would give authority over to me? That is, you'll let me judge him? So you will, you will give away your rights, your, what you called earlier your duties, your, your office, your place of obligation or responsibility? Chorus leader, by all means. We respect your merits and whence they are derived. Hold on.
Certainly, they say in this other edition, we respect you. Why? You show us respect. Yes, we'll, we'll take your judgment. Why? You've honored us. You've shown us honor, right? So they agreed to be bound by her verdict. Athena says, all right, Orestes, what will you say in answer? Line 436, speak, tell me your country, your birth, what has befallen you? That is, can I have some kind of ID? Can you tell me, you know, what your history is, why you're here? Then defend yourself against the censure of these. If it is confidence in the right that makes you sit guarding this image near my heart, a supplicant in the tradition of Ipsian sacrosanct. Come on, tell me. So, Orestes responds. So I keep sitting here looking out my window because it looks like it's just going to thunder like crazy, which is kind of fitting given the um, setting here. So, Orestes says, line 444 on page 140. I am no supplicant, nor was it because I had a stain upon my hand that I sat at your image. He says, I'll give you a strong proof of what I say is true. Skipping a bunch, pick up with 454. I am of Argos, and it is to my honor that you ask the name of my father, Agamemnon. Now, she knows Agamemnon. She, she knew Agamemnon. Lord of seafarers and your companion. You know, that's kind of like, um, not Oedipus, it's kind of like Oresi's going, <laughs> yeah, and, and Athena, you know, you and, you and Agamemnon, you were pretty close during that whole Trojan War thing. When you made the Trojan city of Ilium no, more, uh, no city anymore, he died without honor when he came home. It was my mother of the dark heart, tangled him in intricate nets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I was in exile in a time before this. I came back. I killed her. I don't deny it. My father was dear. This was vengeance for his blood. Apollo shares responsibility. He counterspurred my heart. Now that, that verb, counterspurs, he went against my heart. That is, Orestes is saying, I didn't want to do this. He, he, he kind of prodded me and told me of pains to come if I should fail to act against the guilty ones. Go back to what Athena says on line 426, not by compulsion nor fear of someone's wrath. Okay, the compulsion was Apollo counterspurring his heart and the fear of someone's wrath, the pains to come if I should fail to act against the guilty ones. This is my case, decide if I be right or wrong. I'm in your hands. Where my fate falls, I'll accept it. So they both said, the chorus leader, Furies, and Orestes have said, we'll abide by your judgment. Athena, the matter is too big for any mortal man who thinks he can judge it. But notice, she's not a mortal man, so she can. But he's saying, this isn't up for a single individual to judge. 475. Now, back up. Let me just read that whole speech. Nor yet, nor yet, do I have the right to analyze cases of murder where wrath's edge is sharp. And all the more, since you have come and clung a clean and innocent supplicant against my doors. You bring no harm to my city. I respect your rights, Orestes. Yet these two, that is, the Furies do have rights, she says. We cannot brush them aside. That is, the moral underpinnings of the universe have got to be obeyed. And if this action so, so runs that they fail to win, the venom of their resolution will return to infect the soil and sicken all my land to death. So she says, and if I rule against them, they'll come back and they'll ruin Athens. Here is dilemma. Dilemma, a splitting apart. Here's a problem. How do I resolve this? So she says, so since the burden of the case is here and rests on me, I'll select judges of manslaughter and swear them in Establish a court 
into all time to come. Now, what we've just seen is the metaphorical slash mythological foundation of the court of law. We've moved from justice is vengeance to justice is a trial by jury. Litigants, Orestes, Furies, call your witnesses. This is how the trial, this is how the court of law will work. Have ready your proofs, your arguments, as evidence under bond to keep this case secure. I will pick the finest of my citizens, that is, I will pick the best men and come back. So she's going to go off, she's going to find the best men of Athens. They shall swear to make no judgment that is not just and make clear where in this action the truth lies. She leaves. The chorus starts its strophe, anti strophe movements. Here is overthrow, the chorus starts, line 490. Here is overthrow of all established laws. That is, everything from the beginning of time to now is being undone. In terms of, you know, the justice of kinslaying. If the claim of this matricide shall stand, good, his crime be sustained. Should this be, every man will find a way to act at his own caprice. That is, if Orestes gets off, then every human being will act as it, at his own whim and fancy. Over and over again in time to come, parents shall await the death stroke at their children's end. If, if this is allowed, no parent will ever be able to sleep at night without fear of a child coming in and killing them. Right? What they're saying is that the fear of vengeance, the fear of blood for blood, is at the core of the social compact or social order. You know? <laughs> and in the summer of 2020 America, it kind of looks like that. If you look around some of our big cities and you see what's going on, yeah. it's like, you know, what is there to stop some, not all, I'm not talking about peaceful protesting. I'm talking about rioting, looting, setting buildings on fires, you know, shooting people, attacking people. What, what is the only thing that stops that? The fear of retribution. It's, it's, you know, as we read about happening in various jurisdictions, people arming up and forming armed neighborhood patrols because the police either can't or won't do that. I mean, I, this is what the Furies are saying. This is, this is what's going to happen if what Orestes, you know, is arguing becomes the, the so to speak, law of the land. Okay. Antistrophe A, line 499. We are the angry ones. But we shall watch no more over works of men and so act. We shall let loose indiscriminate death. That is, we're not just going to go after those who are guilty. Nah. We're going to let loose, you know, kind of the book of Revelation's four horsemen of the apocalypse. We're going to let death run rampant. We're going to attack people, whether they've hurt us, harmed us, or not. You know, for example, and I don't care your politics, I don't care, you know, your whatever. The businesses burned, looted in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Those business owners and the people who worked at those businesses or the businesses looted and burned to the ground in Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
those businesses, business owners, the people who worked there, the people who shopped at those places had nothing to do with the actions of the police or had nothing to do with George Floyd or had nothing to do with Blake at all. And yet what happened? People saw their livelihoods up, go up in smoke. People saw their jobs. Low income people who worked at some of those, at, you know, the targets and places like that, saw their jobs go and they no longer have jobs. So they no longer have incomes and such. That's what's being, that's the kind of mentality that's being described there. Indiscriminate. Man shall learn from man's lot for judge the evils Notice, for judge the evils of his neighbor's case. What does that mean? I'm going to do unto others before they do unto me. I'm going to take them out before they take out me. Right? They keep going back and forth. Uh, that last speech on page 142, line 5, 17 or so. There are times when fear is good. It must keep its watchful place at the heart's controls. There is advantage in the wisdom won from pain. If the city, if the man rears a heart that nowhere goes in fear, how shall such a one any more respect the right? Strophe C, however, is a change. Refuse the life of anarchy. What does anarchy mean? Against order. It's what it literally means. Refuse the life devoted to one master. So refuse anarchy, but also refuse the life devoted to a master. It's the in-between that has the power by God's grant. I will speak in defense of reason. Whichever the Furies is speaking in Strophe C, whichever group, I will speak in defense of its reason. It's almost like there is this slow transformation going on among the Furies. For the very child of vanity is violence but out of health in the heart is born the beloved and the longed for prosperity. Antistrophe C, line 538, I think, page 143. All for all I tell you, Show respect for the altar of right. Right there, what is morally right. You shall not eye advantage and kick it over with foot of force. Vengeance will be upon you. The appointed in fate. <laughs> fate. Maybe death. Destiny. Awaits. Oh, Let someone see this and take care. Take care to father, to mother and father. That is, let someone see what I'm talking about. Pay attention to his mother and father and to the guest, Zinnia, in the gates welcomed. Give all honor respecting their position. Respect, honor your father and mother. Honor the wanderer, the guest. 550. The man who does right, free will. That is, the man who does right by his own choice. without constraint, not being forced to, because you can't. You can't do right. You can't behave rightly um, without free will. You can't be forced to be virtuous. See, the, the word virtue ultimately derives back to the word for power, and it's the power to act. But you can't act virtuously. You can't act righteously if someone has a gun to your head because there's no choice involved. It, it must involve the choice between right and wrong, good and evil. The man who does right, free will, without constraint, shall not lose happiness, nor be wiped out with all his generation. The Furies are saying, if you behave rightly, if you behave appropriately, of your own free will, you, you won't be unhappy, but the transgressor, the person who, you know, 
hamartias, the word I used the other day that gets translated in the English New Testament as sin, misses the mark. But the transgressor, I tell you, the bold man who heaps up confusion of goods, unjustly won. That is, the rich person who gets his riches wrongly. Well, how can you get your riches wrongly? Well, you can steal them. You can, you know, abuse and exploit somebody, you know, own a mine and not take care of your, the, you know, the miners, not pay them, you know, a good living wage, you know, that kind of thing. At long last and perforce, when his ship toils in the storm, must strike his sail amidst the wreck of his rigging. That is, he will suffer. 560. Divinity laughs at the hot-hearted man. The man who said, never to me, watches him pinned in distress, unable to run free of the wave crests. He had good luck in his life. He talked about the person who, who seemingly has, has just a wonderful life and, and no problems and, you know, doesn't suffer. Now he smashes on the reef of right and drowns unwept and forgotten. And what Aeschylus is kind of implying there, or suggesting, is that there are people who go through this life and, and they don't apparently suffer much, but they will in the next. And there are people who suffer here who won't suffer as much in the next. St. John Chrysostom, an early father of the, of the uh, Christian church, did a, a, a homily, a sermon, on the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Okay? I taught a course called, um, taught it three times, called, uh, what was that called? Early Christian Literature of the Middle East. And in that homily, Chrysostom talks about the rich man and Lazarus. If, in the parable, there's a rich guy, has all kinds of wealth, and there's a poor man named Lazarus. And Lazarus goes and lays outside this guy's gate every morning, and he's so sick and so poor, he can't get up. And for the, the rich man, unable to come in and out of his property, he has to step over Lazarus, and he does. And he never offers anything to Lazarus. He never offers him any aid, any comfort, any food, any water. You know, the dogs come out and they lick Lazarus's sores and, and stuff. Well, Lazarus dies, and Lazarus goes off to Abraham's bosom, heaven. The rich man dies, and he goes to hell. Shale. And Jesus tells the parable, and the rich man looks up into heaven and he sees Lazarus there, you know, reclining in Abraham's bosom, meaning lying there with food and drink, you know, in, in bliss. And he asks if Lazarus can come, dip his finger in water and bring it to the rich man to quench his thirst. And Abraham says, nope, there's a gulf fixed between us. Can't do it. You had riches and blessing in life. Lazarus had nothing, so he gets riches and blessing now. And you get pain and punishment because you didn't lift a finger for Lazarus. Okay? So Chrysostom's point is, those who endure great suffering here, they're enduring that suffering here, so they don't endure it there. Those who have great joy, happiness, and such here, who don't use that to help alleviate great suffering and such here, they will suffer in the next life, all right? So, Athena re-enters. She comes in with 11 citizens. That's why we have 12 jurors. She comes in with 11 citizens and with a herald, and Apollo comes in, and look at the chorus leader's comments to Apollo. My Lord Apollo, rule within your own domain. In other words, get out. You have no place here. This is not your place. This is not your realm. This is Athena's realm. What in this matter has to do with you? Why are you here? Apollo, I'm here to testify. That is, I'm a witness. 
this man, by observed law, came to me as suppliant. That is, after he killed uh, Clytemestra, he came to me, took his place by my hearth and hall, and it was I who cleaned him of the stain of blood. That is, Apollo is saying, I washed him clean. <laughs> Some interesting parallels, you know, with Christian story. I have also come to help him win his case. I bear responsibility for his mother's murder. Now that, <laughs> if the if the camera were rolling, that's that is called what? That is a video confession. I bear responsibility for his mother's murder. So he says to Athena, come on, start, get the trial going. So she tells the Furies, trial is open, yours is the first word. Why do they get the first word? They're the prosecutors. They have to put forward their case. For it must justly be the accuser who speaks first and opens the case and makes plain what the action is. The action meaning, what is the crime? So the chorus leader says, cool, that's fine, we'll, but we'll keep it short. And they turn to Orestes. Simple question. Did you kill your mother or did you not? Yes, I did. There shall be no denial of that. Notice they don't say, case closed. They say there are three falls in the match, talking about wrestling, Greco-Roman wrestling. Um, that's one. Arrestee, so you say, but you have not even thrown your man. That is, yeah, you can say that's a fall, but you haven't even picked me up yet. So, one strike. How'd you kill her? You know, modern murder trial. It's really hard to find someone guilty of murder if a murder weapon is never found, or in the case of someone accused of murder for which the, the deceased, supposed deceased, is not found. You know, defense can say, present the body, show, show me that so-and-so is murdered. Maybe so-and-so is just missing, okay? So, how'd you kill her? Uh, drawn sword, yep, cut a thread. There's two. By whose persuasion and advice did you do this? By order of this guy here. So he testifies. Notice what does that mean? I was compelled. I was coerced. The prophet guided you? Yes. I've never complained of this. I do not know. That is, yep. He told me to do it. I haven't backed away from that before. I don't do it now. Right? Of course, you know, yeah, but when you are sentenced, then you'll talk differently. So, right? Um, Arrest, he talks about how she was polluted and such. You know, she murdered her husband, thereby my father. Um, Orestes asks, why didn't you kill her when she killed my father? Line 605, page 146. The man she killed was not a blood congenital. That is, she's not guilty of the kinds of crimes we go after. And Orestes says, yeah, but don't I share with my mother a blood body? That's the whole point, kid, you know. And he goes on and says, all right, Apollo, your time to witness. I will not deny, line 611, I did this thing because I did do it. But was the bloodshed right or not? Decide and answer. As you can, sir, answer, I shall state my case. To you judges, and he looks to the 11 judges, established by Athena in your power, I shall speak justly. Excuse me, this is Apollo now. I'm a prophet. I shall not lie. That is, I don't lie. Never for man, woman, city, nor my throne, from my throne, etc. Have I spoken a word except that which Zeus, 
father of Olympians, might command. I have never uttered a prophecy that Zeus has not told me to speak. So what has he just done? He's passed the buck. He's just said, Zeus told me to tell Orestes what to do. So you guys are gonna find Zeus guilty. You know, good luck with that. This is justice. Recognize then how great its strength. That is, what Zeus commands is justice. I tell you, follow our Father's will. The recognize then how great its strength? You don't want to anger Zeus. See, this is, this is the, the little, whether you want to think of it as little or huge, problem. It's even with Zeus. It's not this case of moral oughtness, moral rightness. It's, it's Zeus's strength that makes it right. Because it's Zeus's strength that overthrew the Titans. It's Zeus's power. It's Zeus's thunderbolt that has everyone else in subservience to him. So follow our father's will for not even the oath that binds you is more strong than Zeus is strong. Just telling you, don't want to anger the big guy. Chorus leader. Then Zeus, as you say, authorized the oracle to this Orestes, stating he could wreak the death of his father on the mother, and it would have no force. Apollo responds, line 640. The chorus leader speaks again. Zeus, by your story, that is, Zeus, according to what you are saying, and it's a, it's a bit of undercutting Apollo. They're kind of saying, if we accept what you say is true, gives first place to the father's death. In other words, oh, so you're saying that Zeus implies, or Zeus suggests, that the father's death is what's all important. Um, little problem there, yet Zeus himself shackled Elder Cronus. That is, but Zeus killed his father. He didn't literally kill him. He chained him within the earth. His own father. Line 641. Zeus himself shackled Elder Cronus, his own father. Is this not contradiction? How can Zeus be in support of, of you know, the father of Orestes avenging his father when Zeus killed his own father. And his own father, Kronos, killed his own father, Uranus. No, notice, you know, the parallel. So you have the, the genealogical, you know, line of the gods. Uranus, Kronos, Zeus. And over on this side, <laughs> Tantalus, Pelops, Atreus, I, very, very similar. I testify, judges, this is being said in your hearing. That is, are you guys listening to, to this? Are you paying attention? Apollo, you foul animals from whom the gods turn in disgust. How, why? He's appalled that they would ascribe, you know, moral imperfection to Zeus. Zeus could undo shackles, such hurt can be made good. And there's every kind of way to get out. In other words, <laughs> Zeus is going to come after you. But once the dust has drained all down, down, but once the dust has drained down all a man's blood, once the man has died, there is no raising of him up again. And yet, what have we been told about Pelops? Tantalus killed his son, Pelops, and was going to feed him to the gods. The gods knew they raised feel they raised. Pelops back from the dead. Here we've been told they can't do that. All other states without effort of hard breath, he can completely rearrange. 
That is, Zeus can't bring the dead back to life. But talking about all other states, you, you elemental beings, he, he, can, he can do things to you. So Apollo goes on and says, talking about parents, parenthood, mother, father. Because the chorus leader says, he spilled his mother's blood upon the ground. Apollo, I will tell you, page 148, line 657. I will tell you and I will answer correctly. Watch, the mother is no parent of that which is called her child, but only nurse of the new planted seed that grows. She's not parent, she's what? She's like the earth, which holds the seed and the seed grows. He doesn't know about sperm and egg. The parent is he who mounts. That is the parent, the progenitor is the male. A stranger, she preserves a stranger's seed. If no God interfere, I will show you proof of what I've explained. There can be a father without any mother. And he points at Athena. Can't really point anywhere else. <laughs> there can be a father without a mother. There she stands, a living witness, daughter of Olympian Zeus, she who was never fostered in the dark of the womb, yet such a child as no goddess could bring forth. All right? He says, she's the living example of what I'm talking about. Zeus, um, Apollo finishes. And Athena asks, is that it? Prosecutors, do you have any other comments? And they say, every arrow we have has been shot. That is, we've given all of our, all of our arguments. So it's, okay, Athena, how shall I act correctly in your eyes? Apollo says, you've heard what you've heard, cast your votes. Respect the oath you've sworn. So, Athena gives them their charge. Line 681. If it please you, men of Attica, it's another name for Athens, hear my decree now as you judge this case, the first trial for bloodshed. For Aegeus' population, this forevermore shall be the ground where justices deliberate. That is, this pot right here will be where all future courts are held. Here is the hill of Ares, it's the Areopagus, right? And she goes on and talks about that, which we're gonna skip. And so she tells them, I want you to come forward, right? Um, 708, all, all must stand up right now, take each man his ballot in his hand, think on his oath and make his judgment. But my word is said. And so there's an urn. There's an urn kind of in front of Orestes and an urn in front of the Furies, and where they place their pebble, that's who they're determining is right. And every time the chorus leader and Apollo speaks, right, one of the judges comes forth and drops a pebble. So chorus leader, the first judge comes forward. I give you counsel by no means to disregard this company. We can be a weight to crush your land. That is, I'm threatening you, Athena. Clink, pebble is dropped. Then Apollo speaks. And Apollo says, I command you to fear, not make void the yield of oracles from Zeus and me. He's not speaking to the judges. He's talking to the Furies. Chorus leader, pebble three gets dropped. Then we go all the way through. Finally, the chorus leader has the last word. And the chorus leader says, 731, since you, a young god, would ride down my elder age, you young whippersnapper, you know, I must stay here and listen to how the trial goes, being yet uncertain to loose my anger on the state. That is, I don't know what I'm going to do. I might still, you know, unleash hell. And Athena says, it's my task to render final judgment here. 
This is a ballot for Orestes I shall cast. There is no mother anywhere who gave me birth, and but for marriage I am always for the male. That is, I always side with men. With all my heart, swung me my father's side. So in a case where the wife has killed her husband, lord of the house, I shall not value her death more highly than his. And even if the votes are equal, Orestes is the winner. Why? It's got to be unanimous. Even if it's six to six. And in American jurisprudence, in most jurisdictions, it has to be unanimous. There have been some cases where the vote was 10 to two, 10 to two in favor of guilt that the Supreme Court, it just happened a couple of years ago, that the Supreme Court overturned, you know, a, a state Supreme Court's ruling because, you know, it has to be unanimous. So, Oresti says, what's the decision? He's waiting. Chorus leader asks, darkness of night, our mother, are you here to watch? That is, you know, the dark powers. Orestes, this is the end for me, the noose or else the light. Chorus leader, hear our destruction or our high duties conferred. I mean, everything's tense. Apollo says, come on, come on. Athena, the man before us has escaped the charge of blood. The ballots are in equal number for each side. Half of them thought Orestes was guilty, and half of them thought he was innocent. So Orestes thanks Athena. You kept my house alive, blah, 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 blah. And the chorus, you know, the, the chorus of the Furies, they're starting to fume. And, and, you know, your book tells us on page um, 153 that the chorus in Athena kind of go back and forth and the chorus sings their lines and such. And the chorus says, gods of the younger generations, again, copper page 153, this is line 778. Gods of the younger generation, you have ridden down the laws of the elder time, torn them out of my hands. I, disinherited, suffering, heavy with anger, shall let loose on the land the vindictive poison dripping deadly out of my heart upon the ground. I'm going to unleash holy hell essentially. What shall I do? Afflicted, I am mocked by these people. I have borne what cannot be borne. Great the sorrows, etc., etc. So, they're allowed, about to unleash, you know, the apocalypse on Athens. And Athena says, whoa, 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 calm down, calm down. She has a plan. And she says, listen to me. I would not have you be so grieved, for you have not been beaten. It seems like they've been beaten. This was the result of a fair ballot, which ended up even. That is, half voted for you, half voted for Orestes. That's not beaten, that's a draw. You were not dishonored, but the luminous evidence of Zeus was there. Zeus, you know, there's, there are other references, and I can't remember any within these plays, but, you know, Zeus of the shining something or other. And it's kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like she's saying, you know, while we were deliberating, it, it's almost like this light came down just as a, you know, a gentle reminder, or maybe there was thunder, you know, kind of like, hello, I'm still here. The luminous evidence of Zeus was there, and he who spoke the oracle was he who ordered Orestes, that is, if Zeus told him to do this, he can't find the kid guilty. Do not be angry any longer with this land, nor bring the bulk of your hatred down on it. Do not render it barren of fruit, nor spill the dripping rain. Don't unleash hell on it. He says, she says, here's what we'll do. In complete honesty, I promise you a place of your own, deep hidden underground that is yours by right, where you shall sit on shining chairs beside the hearth to accept devotions offered by your citizens. I will give you a place, she says, deep in the ground beneath Athens where people will offer you sacrifices. See, people don't offer anything to the Furies. 
the, the Furies get no respect. You know, they're the Rodney Dangerfields of, of the gods and elemental powers and such. And they repeat the lines that they said previously. And Athena says, no, line 824, not dishonored, you are goddesses. Well, earlier she said what? You're not gods, or goddesses, and you're not human. You're something else. You're, you're your own kind of thing. You're in between. Now she's saying, you are goddesses. This is what's called apotheosis. They are being made godlike. They're being made into goddesses. All right? Do not in too much anger make this place of mortal men uninhabitable. She says, I have Zeus behind me. That is, every word I'm speaking to you right now, it's like Zeus is speaking through her. This is Zeus giving you this option. I am the only God who knows the keys to where the thunderbolts are locked, blah, blah, blah. So, 832, put to sleep the bitter strength of the black wave and live with me and share my pride of worship. That is, live beneath Athens. Athens is her city. And share my pride of worship. My, my participate in the worship that is due to me will be due to you also. Here is a big land, and from it you shall win first fruits and offerings for children and the marriage rite for always. When people get married, they will bring offerings to you for blessings of children through those marriages and for blessings of the rite of marriage. <coughs> then you will say my argument is good. Because what do they do now? They relish in death. That's it. I, the chorus goes on, that they could treat me so. I, the mind of the past, blah, blah, blah. They, skipping a bunch of lines, 845, they have wiped me out. The hard hands of the gods, their treacheries have taken my old rights away. Athena's like, shh, calm down. I will bear your anger. That is, go Go ahead, let it out. I'll, I'll take it. You are elder born than I, and in that you are farther, wiser far than I. Yet still Zeus gave me intelligence not to be despised. If you go away into some land of foreigners, I, I warn you, you will come to yearn for this country. That is, you'll want to come back here. Skip to the end of her speech. 868. Do good. Receive good and be honored as the good are honored. Share our country, the beloved of God, meaning really Zeus. And the chorus repeats what it said earlier, that they could treat me so, etc., etc. Athena, I will not weary, 881, of telling you all the good things I offer. That is, she keeps hearing them. And she keeps going on. She keeps making the pitch so that you can never say that you, an elder god, were driven unfriended from the land by me and my youth. She says, I'm just going to keep telling you what I'm offering you. And the chorus says, chorus leader, what is this place you say is mine? That is, what's that offer again? A place free of all grief and pain. See, their existence up until this point, from their origins, has been an existence of grief and pain. That's it. They've never experienced joy. They've never experienced love. They are, they are beings of grief and pain. She's talking about their transformation from grief and pain to uh, love and joy. If I do take it, shall I have some definite powers? That is, perks that go along with it, so to speak. But what will my powers be? That is, what powers will I have? Powers of action, 
No household shall be prosperous without your will. No house shall be prosperous. Nobody will become rich, as a you know, simplistic example, without your desire, without your making them rich. You'll do this? I'm like, come on. What's in it for you? <laughs> it's almost like what they're asking. You will do this? You will really let me be so strong? So we shall straighten the lives of all who worship us. Straighten. That means take what are now crooked, excuse me, crooked wandering paths, and we'll straighten them out. That is, we'll make their lives easier for those who worship us. You guarantee? I don't need to promise what I cannot do. What's the cannot do for the rest of time? And the chorus leader says, you know, I, I, I think your way is going. I think you will have your way with me. My hate is going. Athena, stay here. Gain others too as friends. Chorus leader, I'm going to put a spell on this land. What spell shall it be? What kind of spell? And what is a spell? It's a word of power. What kind of blessing shall I put on this land? Athena, something that has no traffic with evil success. Let it come out of the ground, out of the sea's water, and from the high air make the waft of gentle gales wash over the country in full sunlight. And the seed and stream of the soil's yield and of the grazing beasts be strong and never fail our people as time goes, and make the human seed be kept alive. In other words, be goddesses of fertility. Make the land always fruitful. Make the people always fruitful. Make the winds gentle and calm, not hurricanes. Make the, the seas and the rivers flow gently, not in flood. Make more the issue of those who worship more your ways. Bless those who worship you. For as the gardener works in love, so love I best of all the unblighted generation of these upright men. All such is yours for granted. In other words, all you got to do is take it. In the speech and show and pride of battle, I myself shall not endure this city's eclipse in the estimation of mankind. And then what do we see? I accept this home at Athena's side. See, what is this? It's their apotheosis, but it's also what? She's called on them to help bless the land. Well, what does that mean? That's part of the civilizing process to take what is wild and untamed and make it cultured, cultivated, and such. So she says, the chorus says, you know, I will accept this home at Athena's side, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll rule with, you know, Zeus and Ares and such. Um, top of 158. I sing this prayer for them, that the sun's bright magnificence shall break out wave on wave of all the happiness life can give across their land. And that's a pretty significant change in attitude. And Athena says, and here's what I will do. In all goodwill towards these citizens, I establish in power these great divinities. So I'm now making in power these divinities. These are for citizens of you know, goodwill and such difficult to soften. To them is given the handling entire of men's lives. That man who has felt the full weight of their hands takes the strokes of life, knows not whence, not why, for crimes wreaked through past generations, drag him before these powers, loud his voice with the silent doom, etc., etc. Chorus, let there blow no wind that wrecks, wrecks the trees, I pronounce words of grace, no blaze of heat, blind the blossoms of grown plants, etc., etc., Secret child of earth, her hidden wealth, bestow blessing and surprise of God. Athena then says, you know, calls them strong guard of the city, etc. Page 159, line 96. Um, no, let's back up, 956. Death of manhood cut down before its prime, I forbid. So, men won't die, and women won't die young. 
Girls' grace and glory find men to live life with them. Rather interesting, you know, there's all this stuff about, oh, ancient Greece, it was all homosexual and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, real love was between only men and women were only there for sex, you know, the propagation of the race. Aeschylus doesn't give, give us that attitude. Aeschylus makes it clear there's real love between men and women. Um, Girls' grace and glory find men to live life with them. Grant you who have the power and austerian spirits of law, goddesses of destiny, those are the fates, sisters from my mother here, in all houses implicated in all time heavy of hand on whom your just arrest falls, most august, that is highest, among goddesses. All right? Athena then talks about Zeus and persuasion. Chorus goes on, talks about civil war. This my prayer, that is, my, my supplication to the gods and such. Civil war fattening on men's ruins shall not thunder in our city. Let, let Athens never undergo civil unrest. Let not the dry dust that, drink, that, that drinks the black blood of citizens through passion for revenge and bloodshed for bloodshed, the two things that were the modus operandi of the Furies, be given our state to prey upon. No, let them render grace for grace. Let love be their common will. Let them hate with single heart. Much wrong in the world thereby is healed. No more eye for an eye. Athena, 989. Are they taking thought to discover that road where speech goes straight? In the fearsome look of the faces of these, I see great good for our citizens. While with good will you hold in high honor these kindly spirits, their will shall be good as you steer your city, your land, on an upright course clear through to the end. So the chorus says, farewell, farewell, high destiny shall be yours by right. Farewell, citizens seated near the throne of Zeus, the gods, beloved by the maiden he loves, the people of Athens, and they're going to go down into the earth. And she says, goddesses, farewell. Athena does. 1003. Mind to lead as these attend us to where by the sacred light new chambers are given. Go then sped by majestic sacrifice from these. And there are people offering sacrifice, plunge beneath the ground. They hold off what might hurt the land, pour in the city's advantage. Success in the end. Okay. Um... And then we hear Athena, 1025, page 161, flower of all the land of Theseus. Theseus is a famous Duke leader of Athens, of Athens. Let them issue now, that is, all the youth, all the, the people in their prime, let them come out of Athens. Now, grave companies, maidens, wives, elder women, in processional, in the investiture of purple stained, excuse me, um, women, all women. Purple stained robes dignify them, let the torchlight go before so that the kindly company of these within our ground may shine in the future. So the chorus replaces their black clothes, the Furies replace their black clothes with reddish purple ones. Why reddish purple ones? Well, reddish, the crimson, like the cloth that Agamemnon stepped on. Purple, it's the color, color of royalty. Right? So the chorus, you know, sings some more. And they all depart in procession. And, and according to my other edition, you know, there are, as I said, there are accounts of how this looked in production in Aeschylus's day. And what would happen is the chorus, the former Furies, now the Eumenides, they lead the procession, they walk off the stage and they walk up and they go through the amphitheater because the, the stage, you know, the, the Greek um, theater, you got the flat spot where the, the actors are and then, you know, the chorus is, is down before that and then it rises up like in a regular amphitheater where there are, you know, brick slash concrete seats and such. Well, what they do is the chorus of humanities walks off the stage and they lead the actors, the other actors, and then all the audience follows behind them and they walk 
out of the theater and on up to the Acropolis. I mean, this, this is actually how, how it was done. So to wrap up, notice the progress. Retribution, vengeance, blood for blood, eye for eye, to trial by jury, reason, law, chaos, disorder, order, wildness, anarchy, civilization. Right? And ultimately what's being discussed, what's being hashed out is the idea of justice. Now, there are going to be other writers later, we're not talking about them, you know, who Aristotle's one, Socrates is one through Plato's dialogues, who will really talk a lot about what is justice. You know, justice is one of the, the quote unquote great ideas of Western civilization beauty, truth, justice, virtue, honor, loyalty, friendship, you know, those kinds of things and and what they might what they mean it's it's part of the 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 greek you know contribution to western culture you know the idea of what is the good life which assuming we do the the little bit of plato that we'll do assuming we do that we'll talk a bit about that about what is the the summa bonum the highest good all right um but the the other thing to wrap up n notice you know the inverted again the trying to do this, the inverted pyramid. You, you start off with the death, <laughs> you come down another death. That's the, you know, kind of the turning point. Well, how is society restored? I mean, Agamemnon obviously isn't restored. Clytemnestra isn't restored, but what is? Well, society is saved. Orestes is saved. How so? Because you get this movement from over here from this, this inchoate, you know, hatred, retributive, just you killed one of mine, I'm gonna kill one of theirs, to no, let's let the legal course take over. Let's let civilization, let's let rationality, let's let reason, let's let evidence, be applied in a court of law and see what happens, okay? All right, we'll stop there. Um, I will put up a couple of quizzes, one for the libation bearers and one for the humanities. Um, Monday, there is no class because it is Labor Day. So have a good day off.